Uh, so uh, welcome everybody to the Magnets uh, series of seminars. The seminar format is as usual, 25 minutes uh, presentation followed by a uh, question and answer time. And you can, you can type uh, the questions in the chat and uh, we will read it out for you. And um, so today I'm really happy to introduce to you uh, Christian Oneiser from uh, Otago University of New Zealand and also University of Vienna recently. And uh, Christian is going to talk about the West Antarctic ice volume variability traced by obliquity until 400,000 years ago. So please, uh, Christian, the floor is yours. Well, um, thanks, Anita. Um, yeah, this talk is all where are we? There we go. I've got to share my screen. Um, yeah, so oh, come on. Big. There we go. Um, so this is a story that began as something else, but then turned into um, this publication, which we we managed to get out at the end of 2022, start of 23. Um, yeah, and it, it began actually as a Holocene story, but um, then gone, I got stuck. So this is more of a journey talk, um, and there's, it, it has its roots in paleomagnetism, um, but then it kind of speared out into a bunch of different directions as as needed to figure out what's actually happening. Um, where are we? Cool. All right. So there we go. Um, this is roughly what I'm going to be talking about, um, maybe. Um, why would we study Antarctica in the first place? Some of this might be familiar to you. Others might be um, not familiar with this. Um, I could give a background, a thorough background in Milankovitch theory and then a paleomagnetism background, but I don't need to do that for this audience. But I, I think I should give you some Antarctic geography lesson there. Then I'll go on to this core, which is an NBP, which stands for Nathaniel B. Palmer. It's an icebreaker that goes down to the Antarctic. And that's this core that we, we found by accident, really. Um, and finally, once I've got all that sewed up, we'll, we'll talk about what this record actually is and why it's a quaternary Antarctic glaciation record that's pretty unique. So why should we bother doing all of this business? Um, so you've probably heard of the IPCC before, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, in 2022 to 23 report, that's AR6. They did a really nice job of trying to tie together why we should care about all of this business. Um, and this is a kind of a graph showing the average global temperature starting in 1900, finishing up well, 80 years from now. And, and who should really be most concerned about this? As someone born in the 50s, like my parents, um, you know, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, by the time that they die, they're not really going to be in a very hot world. Um, where I'm born, I'm an 81 baby. Um, and so I'll be in 2050. That's when I'll expire and it's going to be warm. But my kids, they're the ones that are going to be most affected. Um, and the thing that they really tried to hammer across the IPCC was that it depends on the choices that we make right now and in the near term is which future our kids basically experience and, and us when we're, when we're on the way up. And their personal choices as well as government choices. And I like to think of them as personal choices. So why Antarctica though? So this is the really cool thing. Um, there's some little bits of text buried in the IPCC, which is um, the li low likelihood outcomes associated with very potentially large adverse impacts. That's, that's why people study Antarctica. So what are some of these low likelihood scenarios? And one of the really interesting ones is that the likelihood a high impact storyline includes an ice sheet instability process in Antarctica, which then really upsets all of our sea level projections and, and makes things um, go in a very different direction. This is one of these low likelihood, but very high impact storylines. And, and the link to that is, is Antarctica. So that's the IPCC setting the scene, but why do we do the paleoclimate part of it? So um, this is a little cartoon for um, a whole big generalist audience. And so we've got the sun on the left and we've got a paleoclimate record on the, on the right. Um, the sun gives us the incoming solar radiation, day, night, winter, summer, um, long time scales, glacial interglacial cycles, and that's all run by Milankovitch cycles. So that comes in, the earth transforms it, the black box is the climate system, we are part of the climate system, so there's natural feedbacks, there's a carbon cycle, there's albedo, which is how much ice we have, and then there's that little fella there with a match that's on fire, that's us, we're part of that black box, and we've just done something to the black box. Um, a, a good thing to do is to figure out how the black box works. And we still haven't quite got a handle on that. And that's to go to the paleoclimate record and see um, what secrets that has about how this system actually functions before we start perturbing the system in, in ways that have never happened before. So that's setting the scene again about why we bother doing these paleoclimate things. So 
a short introduction to Milankovic cycles, just for those that may, may be forgotten. So this is a, a picture of our Milky Way and where the sun is. That's our corner of the Milky Way. So that's our solar system where we live, our home. This is the solar system way, way, way back in the day before the Hadean. Um, the sun is just starting to warm up and there's little bits of rock. They haven't coalesced in the planets yet, but eventually they do coalesce and they become planets. And so this is our home. Um, Pluto's still there because, you know, I like Pluto. Um, but so the way that the system works is you'll notice there's the sun again on the left and, and all the planets have different masses and they have different orbital parameters and so they affect one another. And so this is why they're not perfectly circular orbits and why the axes, the spin axes change with time. But that's our solar system. And that's because of gravity, essentially. Here's some animations that I stole from NASA um, and a record of what these um, what these records look like over the last million years. So these are the three main orbital parameters. And these are essentially the long-term, or govern the long-term heartbeat of the Earth and ocean system. And so it's insulation that controls the heat distribution on planet Earth and where that heat falls. At the top, we've got precession, that, that spinning top. And if my pointer shows through, that little fella there spins around in circles. That is the wobble of the spin axis. Uh, it runs on about 23,000 years. Um, about because there's a few different frequencies, but the last million years look, look something like this. There's high amplitude and low amplitude bits. This is the obliquity. So this is the, the angle of the tilt. Come back. The angle of the tilt. Um, and that's how much of how much the poles point towards the sun. And so if you point the poles towards the sun, they get warmer and they start to have less ice in them. And if you point them away from the sun, then they tend to grow ice sheets. So well, that's the insulation theory anyway. And the last thing down the bottom there is the eccentricity, which is the shape of the orbit. If it's a low eccentricity, um, so somewhere down there, then it's a very circular orbit. A high eccentricity, it's, a, it's, a, it's an egg-shaped or an oval orbit. And so all of these things add together to, to drive our climate system if we haven't perturbed it or if it hasn't been perturbed. Um, so what we've done basically is we've, we've pushed the system out of balance. Well, yeah, we are pushing the system out of balance still. Anyway, that's what should be driving the system. Um, these are the, the regular rhythmic bits. Cool, so that's the solar system introduction. Hopefully, we're good with that. Um, and I hope I'm not going too fast or I might be going too slow, I don't know. Paleomag, I don't need to introduce this audience to what paleomagnetism is. Some audiences do need a reminder. The last thing is Antarctica. So I um, come from New Zealand. I used to live just around the corner here. If you can see where my point is pointing, that's a bit of New Zealand there, or is that Tasmania? No, New Zealand's over there, actually, yeah. Um, so this is Antarctica. Um, it's close to New Zealand, so every New Zealander knows about Antarctica, but it's far away from Europe and the Northern Hemisphere, so people tend to know less about Antarctica. Um, it's a lot of ice down there. Um, the world's largest ice mass, obviously, uh, at the moment, anyway. Um, and, and there's a few parts to it. So there's two very big ice sheets. There's the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is in the East, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is in the West. How they decided on East and West is still a mystery to me. Um, then we have, so these things are grounded. Well, they're, they're attached to the earth. Um, so the East Antarctic ice sheet is actually grounded above sea level. The West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded below sea level. That's an important thing to remember. Then we have the ice shelves. There's the Ross Ice Shelf and the Woodall Ice Shelf. These are the two main ones that I, I focus on, but I'm actually just focusing on the Ross Ice Shelf. So these are floating on the water and they're fed by the ice sheets. And finally, we've got this big ring of sea ice, that fella there, that's all around there. This thing collapses and regrows every year. So it melts in the summer and regrows in the dark winter. Um, and so that's, that's Antarctica in a nutshell. The ice shelves don't come and go. Um, on short time scales, nor do the ice sheets, but the sea ice does come and go. And until recently, the sea ice was um, the darling of all paleoclimate, or sorry, uh, climate change denialists, because it was leaving, it wasn't really following the models. Um, models were saying ice, the sea ice should be getting smaller, and it wasn't, it was getting larger around Antarctica. Um, all of that changed last summer when suddenly it, it, it didn't grow in the winter, it just never really, really recovered. Um, we're not really sure what it's doing just yet. Or maybe I'm just not really sure what it's doing this, this winter down there because it's dark down there at the moment. Anyway, that's Antarctica, Antarctic geography. Why does all of that matter? So there's a cartoon that I stole from the IPCC and, and ruined mostly, I think. The East Antarctic ice sheet, that's on land. Um, if that flows into the sea, we get about 50 metres of sea level. The West Antarctic ice sheet, which is grounded below, 
the land, so below sea level. If we drop that into the sea, we get three metres of sea level. So that's still a lot, a lot more than what, what we need to deal with. The ice shelves, which are fed by the ice sheets, they're already in the water, so they don't raise sea level. And the sea ice grows and disappears every summer, so that's not really important either right now in this talk. Um, so why are the ice shelves important? Well, um, this is a map of the flow speeds or surface speeds of the ice. Uh, this is from Christina Hulber. She's redrawn this from Rigno. Um, the hot colors are fast flowing ice, so that's a thousand meters per year. The blue colors are ice that's not going anywhere. So you'll see that the ice shelves are fed by these big ice streams um, and that stuff flows out like a big ooze forms these ice shelves, which then break off into icebergs um, and they, they basically, they're a buffer holding back the ice sheets. So the ice shelves are important, as is the sea ice, because they are they create hypersaline deep water. So this is water that's below freezing point. So it's minus two degrees, but it's very salty. So it can still be a fluid. Um, that stuff is so heavy and dense that it flows off the continental shelf into the deep ocean, and it actually drives the ocean circulation system. Um, the ice shelves also provide that buffer between the ocean and the ice sheet, which is important. Um, and so if the ice shelf goes away, then, then the sea level will not rise because well, the ice shelves are already in the sea. But the problem is then you lose the buffer between the ice between the ocean and, and the ice sheet. Um, and then the ice sheet responds by sending more ice into the sea. Um, so how do we break an ice shelf? Well, there's a few ways you can do it. You can melt it from underneath. Um, or you can melt it from top down. Um, I'm going to skip over that because I'll come back to the slide in a second anyway. But but the, the thing is the surface waters are very cold, minus one degree, so that doesn't affect the ice shelf too much. The deep water, um, we're going to call it warm, it's plus one or two degrees, which is bad for the ice. So if we bring that deep water up because we're changing the way that the system works because of the way we've affected the climate system down there, um, then we can affect the stability of the ice shelves. Um, and an example of this is the Larsen Ice Shelf, um, which fell apart 22 years ago. It doesn't feel that long ago. Um, that's on the Antarctic Peninsula where that, that little red circle is there. Um, and when, when these ice shelves do fall apart, they do so very, very quickly. And this one surprised people. It began January 31st with these meltwater pools on the top. And this is an ice shelf the size of England, so it's quite big. Um, and within a matter of months, the thing fell apart. Meltwater pools at the top forced the ice shelf onto a thousand millions of tiny little bits and pieces and it all went away. Um, the consequence of that was that ice streams sped up. So more ice from on land flowed into the ocean and then that's the thing that drives up sea level. Now at the time of this breakup, we were still learning more about the physics of ice shelves and how they work. Um, and, and one thing that happened later on was that ice sheet models then incorporated a a few mechanisms how you can melt an ice shelf so you can melt it from underneath or you can you can do a thing called an ice cliff failure um this is a clip that i stole from the internet from youtube it's from a thing called chasing ice some of you might have seen that before um this is a bit of an ice stream in greenland in yakov's Haven, i think it's called falling apart um and this if you see there's the timer down there it's happening quite quickly um i think it loops back around but this is all happening in a matter of hours um it's from nine o'clock in the afternoon to 10 o'clock, basically. And, and for scale, that's about Manhattan Island that's tipping over right there. So it's quite a lot of ice that suddenly fails very quickly because of an ice cliff. It's basically when you've got an ice wall that's too tall to support the ice mass behind it. So you can melt it either top down with meltwater pools, break off a bit using an ice cliff mechanism, or you can just melt it from underneath by injecting warm water underneath. This is still setting the scene. So why do we study the past and intact, looping all the way back around? We want to know how quickly things have changed in the past to try and have a guess at how likely this high impact, low likelihood storyline is, is going to, you know, how likely is that story? At the moment, it's a low likelihood, but we want to figure out um, how things have worked in the past. Because all we've got is basically models or paleoclimate. Um, for understanding how the Antarctic works. So now I'll actually talk about the science of this talk. And so it began, it has its roots in a, in a project that was funded by the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute. Um, back in 2015, we began on this and we wanted to reconstruct the late Holocene retreat of the Eastern Ross Ice Shelf. So um, this is uh, a 
beautiful black and white map of, of the Ross ice shelf here. This is the ice shelf itself. There's the Ross Island. Um, this is a long way. Uh, this is, I don't even know how, how many kilometers, but um, that's the, um, the date line essentially there. Um, and this is the continental shelf over here. And these are the um, core sites. So these are all short sediment cores collected by this icebreaker, the Nathaniel B. Palmer. And, and they should have all been Holocene cores. And so we, we tried to reconstruct the retreat of the eastern part of the Ross Ice Shelf where we have no constraints at all since the last glacial maximum. So the pink line is where the Ross Ice Shelf was during the LGM. Um, and, the, and the project had its roots in using relative paleo intensity and paleo secular variation records. So teasing each one of those out from each core to try and correlate the records. Um, and then we radiocarbon dating works, use those to then transfer the dates to other sites using paleocircular variation records. Um, radiocarbon dating is incredibly difficult in Antarctica because the carbon pool is very, very old. So even the creatures that are eating things down there right now, they're eating animals that have an apparent radiocarbon age that's already a few thousand years old because they're all eating very old carbon. So carbon dating is really, really difficult down there. So we need to find other ways of of doing things. Uh, in the process of doing this research, one of the cores that we measured, that fellow down there, NBP 0301A20, had a reversal in it. And so that was a surprise because it's a six meter long mudstone with a bit of clast succession. And so that already told us that the base of the core is about 1.2 million years old. Um, the magnetic minerals records kind of magnetic mineral concentration records looked a bit wiggly. So we've got magnetic stability here, which is not very good looking in, in an ARM record. So in our of remnants, um, remnant magnetization, sorry, uh, which also looked wiggly. So I found that very interesting because I like looking at wiggles. And so then the question was, is this, is this some record of, of advance and retreat of the ice margin or something oceanographic or well, what's actually going on there? But because the project was Holocene, there were too many unknowns. It was too old, so it was out of scope. So we just basically put it in the too hard basket and, and moved on with the Holocene part of the project. Um, so now looping back around, what and, and why we came back to it, because then I started thinking sometime around about COVID times, I think. Um, what do we actually know about Antarctic quaternary glaciations? Well, there's a record that goes back to before I was born or yeah, records and publications about ice volume records, insulation changes, all the way back to the 70s. And, and everyone in the paleoclimate community knows that the last eight glacial cycles have been paced with eccentricity. So these are 100,000-year advance and retreat cycles of Antarctic ice. So we know that. That's a fact. That's, what I, that's how I was educated when I did my um, undergraduate and postgraduate. And, and I was educated based on a whole bunch of articles and, and papers and lectures and everything. But how do we reconstruct Antarctic glacial cycles? Well, we can look at ice core records. So the ice sheets are incredibly thick. East Antarctic ice sheet is 4,000 meters thick in places. Um, and they're looking for the oldest ice there. They want to go back to a million years worth of ice eventually. So you can look at the ice core records, or you can look off the shelf at the sedimentary records, which maybe give you an an indicator of the ice shelf advancing and retreating. I'll tell you how that works in a second. Or we can go further away and we can look at the deep sea oxygen isotope records. So how do these work? Just to try and be really quick about this because we're not oxygen isotopists. Um, there's a few, there's three isotopes of oxygen. There's two that we care about. There's oxygen 16 and 18. And 16 is the one that there's more of than 18. Um, and 18 is actually heavier. So that's the, the heavier of the isotopes. So when we grow an ice sheet, the ocean appears to be depleted in 16. So that goes up, turns into an ice sheet. And so the ice sheet then has lots of 16 in it and the ocean looks depleted in, in 16 and enriched in 18. If we melt the ice, put it back, then the ocean looks enriched in 16 and depleted in 18. So there's a, an oscillation that we can, we can tease out from foraminifera because they're made out of calcium carbonate. And we can tease out an ancient record of ice or climate on planet Earth. And so you can see down here, this is a, a stacked record, a global stack, 1.8 million years is what I've shown here, but there's more of it from this Lissiki and Ramo paper. Um, and it shows you here from today, all the way back to 1.8 million years ago, the ice coming and going. 
and there's uh, low frequency, high amplitude cycles here going to higher frequency, lower amplitude cycles as we go back. That's not an Antarctic record, it's a mixed global signal. How about, skip that part, Antarctic sedimentary evidence. Well, then when I started looking around the Antarctic margin, we've got a map here, there's two sites that have a quaternary record, IODB 1361 over there, and the Andral 1B record over there. Well, 1361 has the last 500,000 years, and then there's a hiatus. And the Andral record has a one and a half million year record, but it's mostly unconformities. And so the sediments, which can tell us about whether you've got ice or no ice, um, we don't have much of that as well. And so um, there's a little cartoon down the bottom here. This is the Andral drill rig and what it drilled into. So if it's parked here in the middle of the Ross ice shelf, got a drill rig. If the ice shelf and ice sheet is gone away, you've got a, a warmish ocean with diatoms in it. And so you recover that there. So if you see those in a record, then you can say, oh, there's no, there's no ice or there's very little ice. If we have an ice shelf, then we can say there's more mud with drop stones. Um, and then if we have a very, very cold setting where there's a Ross ice sheet, then we can say we've got diamecton with overcompressed diamecton full of big rocks and pebbles and mud. So this is how we can reconstruct how close the ice was and how much ice there was from sedimentary records. So it looks like we don't have much evidence of, of what Antarctica did from sedimentary records. So to summarize, there are tens of thousands of publications on deep sea isotope records. These are distal records. Um, there's this mid Pleistocene transition. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that. There's 565 publications at the time of writing this talk. There'll be more now from ice core records. And there's this MBPO3 record, which looks like it might have higher frequency cycles inside it. So all of these publications are probably right. And the other one probably isn't. That was my conclusion. Or to summarize differently, deep sea isotope records are a mixed global signal. The ice core records aren't from the ice margin, so they're not actually telling us what the ice sheet did. They don't tell us what the ice margin did. And to summarize that, we actually don't have a good continuous sedimentary record of Antarctic quaternary glaciation. So this is the opportunity really for, for this record. So this is why I came back around um, when I had to correct all the stuff that I was taught and had to kind of undergo a, a mental shift in what we don't know and what we do know. Never be afraid to question what you don't know or acknowledge what you don't know. Um, so the conclusion was, let's push this record out as far as we can go. And so the record used to live, or the sedimentary succession used to live in Florida. Now it's in Oregon state. Um, so have a look again, what data do we have? What else do we need? And then are we really sure it's quaternary? Cause you know, we could be in, in the year thing. Um, and then what is it a record of? Is it ice advanced retreat or oceanic or maybe something else? So I don't know. So um, here we go, a little bit of paleomagnetism. So it all starts with paleomagnetism at the end of the day. Um, and it, it all began with a, a very good demagnetization record, which left very little doubt um, that, that we did have a proper reversal. So the geocentric axial dipolar inclination in this part of the world is steep. Um, because we're in the Southern hemisphere, it's negative is a normal polarity and positive is a reverse polarity. So we should have minus 82 or plus 82 degrees of inclination. Um, because the cores were not oriented with respect to north, we can only use inclination. And anyway, at the pole, you can't use declination because um, you're sitting at the pole. So it, it does what it wants and it goes all over the place. So we have good reversed and normal polarities. And uh, we have some intervals with, I'll just call them strange magnetizations. Um, but these are very common in Antarctic well, marine sediments or in Antarctic sediments with iceberg rafted debris. So iceberg raft the debris, when an iceberg breaks off, it's usually got some dirt attached to the bottom of it and it floats around on the sea. And then that dirt and the pebbles, they fall out and get mixed in with the marine sediments. And, and if one of those bits of dirt happens to be a basaltic clast, um, that basaltic clast will, will overwhelm the magnetization of the sediment that's surrounding it. Um, and so here's just a few examples of, of some really good normal polarity. Actually, it's just normal. This is the way it is. It's, it was all very well behaved. So very steeply magnetized normal polarity samples here and here. Here's a really good reverse polarity one. And, and you'll see the maximum angular deviations are they're pretty good. Um, there's not really too many ambiguities here. Magnetizations are pretty good as well. Um, these are some of the odd ones. Um, this has clearly got a strange coercivity spectrum because it just doesn't demagnetize in alternating fields. So that's good evidence of a clast in there. 
um, of some sort. Uh, this one here is a horizontal magnetization dish, which, you know, that's impossible for this latitude as well. So these things here are, are, are class rich intervals, which, which we did have some of those. Um, so what we have then is, is a magnetic reversals record. So it's, it's a sedimentary record, mud with class. So we've got to be careful with that and some diatoms. So the diatoms, the little algae that float around, they give us the opportunity to, to do a bit of biostratigraphy and figure out where we are in time. Um, and there was one good diatom at five point, well, not one good, there might have been a few, probably. Um, Fragillary opsis kerguelensis. I think I pronounced that quite badly. Um, at 5.76 meters, so down there, and that has an age range that has to be less than 2.2 million years. So we tried a few different age models. Um, these are out, and you can see the sedimentation rates here of these various opportunities for normal, reversed, normal, reversed, which we have to correlate with now. Um, yeah, and so we, we have to be in this corner here. Um, and so we've either got this option here, which is a 1.2 million year record with a pretty smooth sedimentation rate, or a 350,000 year record that begins about 1.7 and a bitish million years ago, which is a 350,000 or thereabouts record. So two options for age models. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's more than likely that the core top will be today. Um, but you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, Let's look at magnetic mineralogy just to be really, really safe. Um, and there's nothing mysterious going on here. So it's actually very boring as a, as a magnetic mineral record. Um, there's no gregite or any sulfides to speak of. It just looks like a mixed bag of various magnetite grain sizes um, as, as shown over there. There might be the odd interval where there's a bit of more oxidation going on on, on your magnetite um, surfaces. That's quite common down in Antarctica as well. But overall, it's just a really boring minerals record. There's nothing nothing really to speak of. So gives us confidence in the paleomagnetic age model. But then we also have these wiggles here. That was a bit interesting. So the susceptibility and the anhistoritic remnant magnetization apparently have these wiggly bits here. And because I like spectral analysis, so this is a concentration record. And because I do like spectral analysis, I did some spectral analysis on that. And, and what is spectral analysis? Most people try to um, avoid it. Um, I really like it. Um, and, and what it basically it tells us, the frequency spectrum of a time series data set. Um, that's all it does. Um, and once you understand the plots, then, then it becomes less frightening. So we did some spectral analysis and it revealed across the record a really strong obliquity signal in the susceptibility and in the ARM. And so the magnetic mineral concentration, I'm kind of speaking to an audience that understands this, um, is driven by that diamagnetic to ferromagnetic relationship or paramagnetic diamagnetic to ferromagnetic content relationship. And so in Antarctica, the, one of these hypotheses that we developed was that it could be uh, a record of the size and position of the ice shelf. And the way that that works, this is that cartoon again. Um, here we've got the front of the ice shelf. This is the back of the ice shelf or ice sheet. You, you're far away from the open ocean here, which is where your diamagnetic minerals are coming from because this is the biological flux, right? So this is your diatoms, your silicas and all those things. Over here, this is where your terrigenous flux might come from, or it might be from icebergs, which are dropping iceberg rafter debris. And so um, looking at the concentration of magnetic mineral changes might tell you how close your ocean front was to your coring site by the ice shelf oscillating backwards and forwards and just changing the contribution of diamagnets. Um, so obliquity cycles were unambiguous with greater, greater than 99% certainty. And the nice thing was that they're 180 degrees out of phase with obliquity. I'll say why that is interesting in a second. Um, and then the other thing is because it's a 41,000 year beat, it gives us an, a confidence in the age model because we can just count the ticking clock back now. So we thought they would get some more data. And, and one of these is an iceberg graph, the debris record. And so we paid a student to do this. Um, we sieved uh, two to five centimeter chunks of sediment and got the student to count how many two to five centimeter sized class there are, which then gives us a record of iceberg rafter debris. Um, and that's this, this fairly ratty looking thing down here with the, which is spiky. So these are our ARM susceptibility. This is our paleomagnetism with our poor class D uh, interval in there. There's another reversal there. And so, and so we thought, okay, Maybe we've got a story here. This looks pretty good. 
did a little bit more spectral analysis. I'm going to kind of skip over this part here. But we have an XRF data set, which is yes. a mineralogical. Sorry? Five minutes. Five Thanks. minutes. There you go. This is why I'm, I'm accelerating now. Sorry. We did some more spectral analysis. These red stripes here tell us that there's a, a liquidy signal there, if it's in that part there, all the way from, well, this is an edge effect, but there's a continuous obliquity signal from 800,000 years onwards to 300,000 years. The bottom and the top are cut off because of the technique. The titanium, yeah, it's an XRF data set. So it's, it's, it's the, it should be also an iceberg raft of debris or, or terrigenous to uh, a record as well. Um, and then this is the iceberg raft of debris record, which really did look scruffy. They're very noisy and marginal and, and we'll, we thought we'd have a go. So we thought, okay, it seems to be a big deal. No one's seen something like this before. So we'll start at the top. Science, not seen to review. Nature, not seen to review. Nature geoscience is not seen to review. Write to the editor. Why are you not like at the paper? Why did you not send to review? The editor says, okay, we'll send it to review. Reviewers, the XRF is not good enough. The sedimentology is wrong. You've used a bad method. The magnetic mineral record, make lots more measurements. Interesting though, the paleomag didn't have any issues until we got to round five when someone questioned how a superconducting magnetometer works. So anyway, once we went through five rounds of review over about two years, the outcome was the XRF was thrown out. We developed a new micro iceberg rafted re record because a new technique had been developed. Um, this time we didn't pay a student, we did it ourselves. And the paleomag record was unchanged. So what we have here is this updated school plot of these red stripes and things. Um, this is the susceptibility now, which we remeasured because it, it needed to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, it's, it's locked on 41,000 year cycles. ARM is locked on 41,000 year cycles. The iceberg graph, the debris is still a bit scruffy, but it's the best that we could do. And so now we were confident that it was the ice shelf that was coming and going. And it's the first time anyone had seen this. And it disagrees with the deep sea oxygen isotope record. So obliquity has always been hypothesized. Well, obliquity controls insolation, which is how much energy the poles are getting. That's just science. That's just mass. And people have argued this, the people that know about this stuff. They said eccentricity should not control ice advance and retreat at the poles. It just shouldn't happen because there's no power in eccentricity. It doesn't control how much energy the ice sheets or shelves are getting. But insulation is controlled by obliquity. obliquity. There's a lot of power in that. And that should control the ocean temperature. So we suggested there's a lot of text here. Don't bother reading that. But we've seen this now on short-term timescales that when the summer sun warms the ocean in front of the Ross ice shelf, so there's the ice shelf back there. There's Ross Island, the little New Zealand base is there, Scott Base, McMurdo, they're there. And this is a map of, of water temperatures and melt rates. Is it water temperatures? I can't see behind there. Yeah, melt rate. Summer melt rates take off at the front of the ice shelf as the warm water creeps in underneath. And so that was observed for the first time in 2017, 18, published in 2019. And that effect extends underneath the ice shelf all the way to, well, not all the way to the back, but it does extend under the ice shelf. And so it works on short-term timescales. And so we suggested that it might also work on longer timescales that if you slowly build up the energy and you slowly break apart the ice shelf from underneath because of insulation changes, then why not? The ice shelf should be controlled by insulation, which should be controlled by obliquity, not eccentricity. Um, so while the, the, we, we're wrapping up now, so while we're searching for a Holocene record, um, we actually discovered a 1 million record of Ross ice shelf variability and the building block to all of that was a paleomagnetic and environmental magnetic record. Um, uh, and we, we changed a bit about how people think about Antarctica. Well, hopefully, I think the news is still getting out there. Um, so what do we know about Antarctic quaternary glaciations now? Well, now we know that the West, the, the Ross ice shelf and, and in turn, at least this chunk of the West Antarctic ice sheet was running at this 41,000 year cycles all the way to 400,000 years ago, which changes the way that we see Antarctica. And maybe different corners of Antarctica might be operating at different frequencies. Um, and it all is rooted in the fact that this one core, which everyone thought was Holocene, um, actually wasn't. And it was much older than that. And it was the paleomag that, that opened the door to, to us having a closer look and, and maybe um, 
maybe we'll see what Swayce next year brings the the next drilling project, which is in this corner of the Ross Ice Shelf. Anyway, that's a, a paleomag light but environmental heavy story on on what we can do with with an accidental discovery of environmental magnetism and, and paleomagnetism. Um, and this is a picture of some stuffed penguins on the Ross Ice Shelf that I took there when we were there a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's a picturesque place if you're not sitting there in fog, but if you're sitting there in fog, then it becomes less less interesting anyway. So there's a whole bunch of people that 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 need to be thanked for it. Um, but yeah, from that, I think I'll close up now because I might be on target or or even off target. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, it was really really interesting talk. <laughs> Lots of applause <laughs> for you. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you. Um, if there are questions from the audience, you can please raise your hand or type it in the chat. Mm. And while people get uh, there, stop hit, sharing. Shall I? No, no. Please keep. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I can <laughs> share again. I'll keep the penguins there. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, it was a bit fast. It should. It should oh, really take an hour. But, oh. You know, or more. Um, oh, maybe I have a question. Christian, yep. go back to your inclination record. Yes. Oh, yeah, any of those. Any, any of those. Any of those is fine. That one. Oh, no, that one. Yes. It's, yeah, this one is fine. So you have, I cannot see the bottom. Is that, oh, okay, yeah. It's uh, inclination is on the left, right? Yeah, sorry. It's um. I was accelerating at that point already. Yeah, so this is inclination is here and the maximum angular deviation over there. And so... Um, so we don't even, yeah, it's, it's minus 80 something on average yeah. and plus 80 over here. So it's, it's pretty, you can't do a reversals test with this stuff because, um, you don't know which way north is. So it's quite difficult to do. Did you look for excursions? I think the sedimentation, I did look, I think the sedimentation rates are too low to catch them because it's six meters over 1.2 million years. So that was one of the things I thought was, um, yeah. having a look for for a few of these excursions but they're not there i think they've just been kind of bulldozed over or smoothed out sorry not bulldozed over it uh, seems to to happen something around 1.8 meters around yeah. one meter around 3.1 meter depth something but yeah so these yeah. are the gaps in the um in the u channel so there was another figure that i had which i failed to properly explain. These are the section breaks in the U channels. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I've already scooped the data out there because I don't want the section breaks inside the inside the environmental data set. So as it makes a mess of the spectral analysis, it, it then becomes a cycle in itself where you have a cycle every one and a half meters. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, so every yeah, so this is funny that at the end of this break here we also have poor data, which is probably why the break is there. But yeah, this is where there's some bits missing here and and you have the edge effects of the U-channels. Oh, but something maybe at one meter. Something. There? Yeah, possibly. But again, in these class D environments. Yeah. Hard to it's, say. Um, it's hard to say exactly. Yeah, it's not. They're not ideal sediments. They never have been ideal sediments for doing paleomagnetism down in the Antarctic. And yet you got good data. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the shock with this. Um, and there's there's even very little inclination shallowing, which is another problem in that, at that latitude or can be a problem at this latitude. Um, and it can get even worse when your ice sheet comes overhead and squashes the, the sediment even more. But um, this, this site was never overrun by a grounded ice mass, um, we think, because we can't see any evidence for that. It was always uh, semi-oceanic with a, at least some water over, over top. All right, thanks. And I don't know if there is there are questions um, from from people. Okay. Um, greetings to everybody. Hi. I, Hi. I'm sorry I joined a little bit late, but um, I I think I'm very impressed with the presentation. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Hi. My name is Mfoni So. Mm -hmm. Um, MSc student over here in Israel. I'm actually working on um, paleomagnetism also. 
So I, I basically have two questions. The first question is probably I missed out from hearing. Um, what is the sedimentation rate in this um, lake? Uh, is six meters divided by 1.2 million years. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> okay, okay. So, okay. So, my second question is: um, the 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 section you took out at every core break, mm -hmm. like how many centimeters? Oh, uh, it was three or four centimeters that I just of data that we deleted. At the start and end of view channels, because it's a it's yeah it's a common edge effect when the sample is arriving before the sensor as it's going through the magnetometer. Okay. Your inclination goes all over the place, and so does your constant or, or your your magnetization. So yeah. Okay, and you made it consistent. Every 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 core break had the same um, uh, centimeter you took out, or based on observation, or you took. No, out no, it's same? just a. Uh, yeah, it's just very consistent. I just do that. I delete three to four. I can't remember what I did in this case here. Probably four okay. centimeters of data that I deleted beforehand, um, before and after each, or sorry, from the start of each U channel section. Um, yeah, there's a way to to map out your sensors and then to deconvolve that data and correct them, but we never did that at our target because it's it's complicated. All right, I'm sure there you. are other people more educated here on, on how that works. All right, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are other questions. I can actually ask one if that's Keep okay. Keep going, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, um, it, you mentioned susceptibility, you mentioned ARM, it kind of yeah. goes automatically to ask about relative pole intensity. So the ARM was measured to do a RPI record. Right. Um, but I think the sedimentation rate is too low to actually resolve some of the bigger features. Um, it didn't, it, for some reason, it didn't work very well. Um, yeah, and and we felt well, it, was, it was to, we measured ARM to develop the Holocene RPI record. <laughs> <laughs> which right. then turned out that this isn't the Holocene record. Um, and so we put the whole thing in the two heart basket and we felt that we didn't need to develop an RPI record and, and add that next layer of, um, dare I say, complication to this paper. Sometimes I think less is more <laughs> from a yeah. reviewer perspective, <laughs> but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it looked like anyway, it's complicated, but perhaps getting like a threshold of NRM intensities to filter out uh, too many mm. tasks. And then yeah. some ratios with susceptibility are ARM or IRM. Yeah. I, I think there was a good reason for not including it. And I think it had something to do with the, the guidance of your NRM intensity needs to be between this and this. And I think we kind of were outside of the range that is optimal. I can't remember what it was, but I think... Our, our interim range was, you worked with Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she has a rule for this. And I think we were outside of what I thought was reasonable. We had wow. too much, too great an interim variability um, to uh, to actually build a good um, RPI record. That was, I think, what, what led us to not do it. Okay. Amazing. Well, thank you very much again, Christian. That's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. I'm I'm having a few uh, closing slides, so uh, we're gonna have uh, our next speaker. Well, not in July. It's gonna be probably August. And um, you can find this talk and previous talks on our YouTube channel. And so, yeah, thanks again for coming, everybody, and hope to see you soon. <laughs>